Kevin would be very, very proud of me. Right on schedule. <coughs> right on schedule. You know, one minute and however many seconds late, right? Uh, hi. Good morning. <laughs> this uh, talk is called a Survey of Emerging Technologies. And it's probably going to be kind of one of those like recurring talks that I plan to give and then update, you know, refresh the material periodically. Uh, lucky for you all, this is the first time I've ever given this talk. <laughs> so it could really, really be great or it could be terrible. All right. Brief introduction. Okay, so my name is Adam Bergstein. I go by Nerdstein. I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Hope42. Things I enjoy, running, my family, I've got two beautiful kids, craft beer, smoked meats, those are my biggies. I, uh, you can find me roaming the halls of various coffee shops in central Pennsylvania, that's kind of one of the things I like to do. And uh, I'm one of these people that are kind of anal about, you know, using the right tool for the right job and pragmatism and I'm kind of picky about these things. You can find my contact information down there. My co-presenter, who decided not to travel from Alaska to be here today, his name is Ryan Bateman, and uh, he works with me at Hook42. He's a senior developer, uh, extremely, extremely confident with the front-end frameworks and things of that nature. So, uh, you know, React, Gatsby, uh, a lot of the testing frameworks. So, uh, and uh, he too enjoys good beer and, and likes a whole bunch of cool, fun things. Alrighty, so a little bit about this talk. What, what, are you, what can you expect being here? So this is intended to be about 30 minutes by design, but we're probably going to go a little over today because this is we have the time. And it's going to be a broad survey of different emerging technologies that are in the space right now that you maybe want to learn a little bit about, right? They could be up and coming. They could make a dent, you know, in the industry, so to say. But a lot of the framing of which, you know, that I'm going to be sharing these technologies is through the lens of a Drupal perspective, right? How can you view or evaluate these technologies coming from a background of, hey, I use Drupal. Uh, we're not going to get too crazy deep into any of these technologies. That's not the, the point of this talk. It's really more of a survey of, of things that you should be aware of. Uh, so it's going to serve basically as an introduction of sorts. But one of the things I felt that was really important when doing this survey is to look at what problems are actually solved. Like, why would you care about any of this stuff, right? And so I tried to use that as the frame of reference or like the lens that I looked at these technologies as I was putting this together. And I do see a ton of opportunities for us, you know, as Drupal people to sort of expand our horizons and possibly, you know, do some cool things. Questions? All right. So the first technology that I want to talk about is HubSpot. And uh, this, you know, you might think like, well, is it like, what is it? Well, it is a customer relationship management system. By, by trade, by, you know, its label, it is a CRM system. Who here has heard of a CRM system? Does anybody know? Okay, great. So it has all of, you know, kind of the classic conventional CM, uh, CRM features, you know, where you can maintain contacts and you can manage leads and try to store information about, you know, your business state and things that you want to follow up on. Uh, you can also do things like create campaigns, uh, you know, where you're like, oh, I have a goal. I want to raise, you know, a million dollars for this certain thing that I want to do for the business. Uh, and a lot of CRM systems have tools around that, like different operational tools that you can say, oh, I want to track this sales thing in this stage and it's going to move into this stage. So it's got some workflows and some pipelines that are part of the, the tool and the technology. And then a lot of the things uh, that CRM features often uh, have are reporting and benchmarking, right? So they'll give you some metrics on like, oh, am I hitting my goals or do I have enough leads coming in and it'll help you for you know, more business related things. So why, why is HubSpot cool? You know, so, you know, I know you all aren't here to, to be learning about your business objectives. So HubSpot itself 
honestly, is really great because it, it's completely like an ORM system. You can customize the schema behind all the information you want to store. So if your you know, business has certain unique needs and you need to maintain certain fields tied to contacts or leads or campaigns, you can do that. Uh, it has a ton of marketing automation, so it has all these data sources, right? And it can go and pull in information. If you type in someone's business, can load the address information automatically. Uh, and, and so it has a ton of like these kind of automated insights that I would call them that like make it kind of a fun tool that can save a lot of headaches. The thing I like the most, quite honestly, is that it has a ton of APIs. All these web service APIs, it, can, uh, it has very, very, very robust. And so you can integrate with it very easily. It also has a mobile app, and it has a ton of out-of-the-box integrations with things like Salesforce and email clients and so on and so on. So it's got a, a lot of nice technology features that I think make it you know, kind of a level up from the standard uh, CRM system. Here's a brief like just screenshot of kind of some of the pipeline type stuff that they have in HubSpot. It's not a big deal. But uh, the cool thing is you can kind of see it looks a little bit like Trello, but all of this stuff can be kind of extended. You can drag and drop these these uh, you know cards across the different columns depending on where things are. Yeah. Cool. So where where are we going with this? So how does it complement Drupal? Well, first and foremost, you know, it's kind of one of those decoupled things, right? So you could push and pull a lot of information between these two systems because of the APIs, and it's really great you know, to, to do that sort of thing. So we're looking at kind of separation, separating the responsibilities of the systems. Uh, and what, what's the complement there? Well, Drupal can generate a lot of leads, right? So you know, many of the sites have web forms on them that you know, collect a lot of data. I don't know anybody who does web forms in this room, but... Um, <laughs> You know, it collects a lot of data and that data gets managed somehow, right? Well, HubSpot is a great tool for managing leads and managing campaigns, but Drupal is a great tool for collecting those leads, right? If you have a website and that's the public facing part of your, uh, of your business or your presence, right? There's a very high likelihood people are going to want to interact with you and that's a good way to do that. Um, and you know, Drupal obviously has a lot of overlap with its user accounts and things too. So those might be the contacts that get put into your HubSpot system for following up later, right? So there's a good bit of overlap there with, with CRM. Uh, and you know, to look at uh, Drupal as a tool and how those things work, well, you know, you've got all these things that you know, the insights and the analytics and things that are important for for customer relationship management. So it's generating a ton of data and analytics, and then Drupal itself has all the hooks. Uh, and calls to actions and landing pages and stuff that you could potentially tap into. Uh, and then behind the scenes, you know, if you really want to get super deep, uh, you could look to build out different entities in Drupal and have the hooks and things like that that would get fired and get sent into HubSpot depending on what your use case is. So there's a lot of overlap there depending on kind of what your use case are and Drupal is very extensible. So you can kind of take that and then roll it in as you need to. Make sense? All right, so what are we looking at really, like what are the key opportunities here? Well, first, you know, I'm a huge fan of separating responsibilities, okay? Drupal is not a CRM system, it's not. So why not use the best CRM system or, or one that's really up and coming and then make sure that Drupal is integrating with it, right? So when you separate those responsibilities, I feel like that's a great thing to do. And the fact of the matter is, the main problem we're trying to solve is we're integrating these systems together. That's the main thing, the main challenge of what you're trying to do because you really want to be making smarter business decisions and you want to have the right tool to do that. So in these cases, you know, you've got a lot of maybe potential ideas that you could look at. So Drupal can consume data, Drupal can pull information from the HubSpot APIs, and maybe you could build a better experience for your users in Drupal. You can grab data from HubSpot and say, oh, hey, we see that you're participating in these various leads. We see that you're, you know, you've contributed towards this campaign, so on and so on. And it can give them more insight, uh, one-stop shopping, right? They don't have to go to HubSpot to get that information. They can pull it and have it in Drupal. And then Drupal as a provider, that's where, you know, you're pushing into HubSpot. That's really the web form use case, uh, pushing data, pushing analytics so generated from the Drupal system into HubSpot so that HubSpot can do its job better. Does that make sense? Cool. So far, so good? 
All right. We're going to keep rolling on. Rolling on. Elastic Surge. Okay. So who, who here has ever used solar, you know, in the room? Yeah. All right. So we've got, we've got a good uh, frame of reference, I think. You know, so like solar, there's some kind of basic features that Elasticsearch kind of has that, you know, I think everybody should be aware of or per somewhat familiar with, right? First is that, you know, it's intended to, to really focus on speed and performance, right? It's optimized for, for performance needs, uh, really against a large set of information scale, right? You wouldn't use this to maintain five nodes on your Drupal site. You would be using this to store tons of information from logs or from uh, you know events that get hit a lot right on your site so it's really its focus is scale it's non-relational it's flat it's a flat architecture just like solar there's like a flat schema it's not pointing to other tables or referencing other things uh, and uh, one of the key things too is it has all the basic CRUD operations that you would expect I can make records, I can remove them, I can read them, update them, delete them, all that stuff. And it has tables and rows just like every other schematic thing, you know, I have, I can have fields and those fields are stored and wrapped around a table, but it, you can do custom schemas too. It's just like solar in that regard where you can build out what schema you want and you can query it then, right? Hooray. So let's talk about Elastic. So what are some like nice things that Elastic does that, you know, really kind of take it a level up from something like solar. Well, first, it's intended or designed to be a distributed system, okay? So you can have multiple nodes, you can load balance those nodes, you can have failovers, and it is super fault tolerant, right? It is completely designed to do that. Just like we saw with HubSpot, one of the big, big major leg ups here is it has a very robust web service API. Solar or uh, Elasticsearch is 100% REST based. Everything in, uh, in Elasticsearch is hit through a REST API, 100%. Creating indices, schemas, record management, all of it, okay? It has, uh, one thing I think that's really cool about Elastic is they take like the classic data types, but they really expand on that for, for good search use cases. So they have like cool, more semantic data types, things like geolocation or IP addresses that have more meaning behind it. So it's not just a string or a number. Uh, they have ones that you can basically like load and then it has more meaning. So I could say, oh, put in this geolocation and then I know it knows that it's a location and it, you can have a lot more features around that. You know, you could compare like this location to another location and maybe get the mileage between two things. That's one example, right? So when you have more semantic data types, you actually can get a lot more features around that, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, Elastic also has a, a bunch of what I would call like more modern search uh, abilities, things like boosting. Uh, they give it kind of like a, a leg up when you're doing queries or you want to write really complex algorithms that can go through and sort of like show certain records, uh, prioritize certain records. Uh, one of the things to me, though, that really stands out about Elastic is it's not just a search index. If you're using it just as a search index, you know, maybe you could just go with Solar, right? But if you want uh, you know, to really know what the leg up is here, the leg up is the fact that it has a whole stack of technologies with it. <laughs> and we're going to talk about those in just one minute. Uh, and that's really like... Uh, Logstash, Kibana, and Beats, and we'll talk about those. Uh, and it has a SaaS offering, so if you really want to, you know, go and play around with it, you can just buy it very easily. All right, so let's talk about these things. Logstash basically is the ability to manage logs inside of Elastic. So that's one of its primary uses, and it has a ton of integrations. You can collect the logs, parse logs, and transform them, and report on them, uh, so, you know, for us in the Drupal space, this is huge because if you're running like a big infrastructure around Drupal, you can go and consume all of your logs around Apache and MySQL and PHP or whatever you're using, and it's already built in to do that. Like, it has all those integrations right now. Uh, and it also has some really cool things where you can go and, um, you know, 
look at certain insights that if you hit a certain threshold or you see certain things in the log, it can integrate with things like Slack or other notification technologies, pager duty, stuff like that, that you can kind of build a nice stack of, of things to, to make that end to end. Kibana is a data visualization platform, super cool. So you've got all, like tons of data sitting behind the scenes, right? What do you do with it? Well, Kibana is cool because you can go and build these really awesome dashboards that can summarize all the metrics that you're collecting at scale. So it's pretty neat for you know, producing graphs and charts uh, and, and really giving you some good insights around that, that large scale of data. And Beats is the primary consumer. So Beats is like that, that API of the Elk stack that basically goes and tries to say, okay, well, uh, I've got Apache over here and I've got my SQL over here. I've got Docker instances running or I've got Kubernetes. And it can go and pull uh, data from all of those places and consume it. That's the uh, con you know, kind of layer that that happens. It's very modular. So here's an example of like a Kibana dashboard that I thought was kind of neat and sort of summarized a lot of things. But it, it, it brings this kind of home, right? So if you have like good semantic data, you can produce maps like that, right? Of things that are summarizing tons of information. You can see like, oh, like this is where most of my traffic is coming from in the world, right? And then you could produce a lot of other summary information, you know, that look like really nice charts. Like I love that like, you know, crazy line graph over there, right? Like, I mean, it just looks like art, right? It's like, wow, that's cool. So you could do some really, really great insights, uh, and I thought this visual kind of summarized that pretty well. And that uh, is going through Kibana, by the way. I didn't say that. So what are some compliments to Drupal? Well, Drupal, I don't really feel like Drupal's natively uh, great at handling large scales of data. <laughs> it just isn't. Like, you know, the classic example is when you install DB log on production, right? And then you're flooding your database full of log information and it becomes like, you know, 18 gigs of, of data in a month, right? It's like, ah, that's crazy. Don't do that. Um, so you can offload those types of things to something like, you know, the Elk stack and with Elastic and you're Kind of good to go. You're shrinking down what, what Drupal needs to maintain. So Drupal's database can focus on nodes and, and taxonomies and other <coughs> entities and user accounts, right? And it, it, that often helps out a lot with performance. And the other cool thing, you know, in terms of a compliment is most of the time, you know, this Elk stack really is capable of being uh, a consumer of most of the things that we care about, you know, Apache and Nginx and MySQL and PHP. You can send all that stuff uh, to, to Elastic, and it's pretty cool. Search data, too, right? So what are some opportunities? Uh, you know, again, this is another one of those cases of like separating responsibilities, right? But this is more a technical separation, in my mind. Moving larger data sets to something else. And the main problem here is, again, the system integration. We want to offload that, that large data uh, and take advantage of a platform that's better capable of handling it, right? So we can... Uh, Definitely reduce the footprint of Drupal. And again, Drupal can serve here as a consumer or it also can uh, serve as a provider. So as a consumer, it can be sending its search-related data of, of what it wants to index and put that into uh, using Search API. Uh, you could use and embed different Kibana dashboards inside of uh, Drupal as a nice like, hey, here's a visual that you could put right on your Drupal site. And it's got the whole you know, API-based web service consumption and REST API. So it's very, very friendly for you know, a lot of custom integrations because Drupal and, and Guzzle and those types of technologies can support that very easily. Uh, Drupal as a provider, again, we talked about search, but you know, the real opportunity to me is also around log management. I mean, I just think it's huge. All right, so far so good? I'm blazing trails here. Yeah, did I put you to sleep yet? All right, I'm trying, it's not working. Uh, let's talk about Pattern Lab, cool. So who here has heard of Pattern Lab? All right, awesome, see, I'm, maybe it, this isn't emerging, I'm maybe a few years old, who knows. Uh, so what, what does Pattern Lab do? Pattern Lab is a design li uh, library, right? So who here uh, has ever worked with designers or is a designer and understands the conventional, like? I produce comps, and I have wireframes, and I do these style guides, and I'm going to produce an IA document, right? So, like, there's all of these conventional things, right, that sit out there in, like, you know, the designer world. But 
to me, there is a much more modern approach that's evolving here, right? So instead of like producing these things that you can print out on a printer and they look pretty and they work in the very specific use case that they put on that design comp, right? How about actually making something that is a technical asset? How about like delivering something that actually can be reused? And instead of just giving this giant image that looks perfect, right? How about splitting that thing down into really small little parts that are understandable and parsable and digestible? So what we're talking about here is actually something called atomic design and those principles. And we're going to get into those a little bit more uh, here in a few moments. Howdy, sir. And one of the great things about it is you still kind of get the exact same end result, right? You can still have the ability to show a whole page of design comps, right? But you get so, so much more than just a regular mock-up that's static. All right. I want to talk about this problem because I swear to God, like, I can't tell you how much I have struggled in this during my career. Working across these disciplines is so hard to do well. They're like different brains, right? Like the right side of the brain, the left side of the brain are fighting with each other in this, in this paradigm. And this collaboration is just so difficult to do well. And design is one of those things that ends up crossing and bridging this technical and creative discipline, right? Both of those things end up having to come together to work to make this go. And, and more often than not, like, you know, it, it's one of those, like, how, how can I throw something over the fence philosophies, right? I'm going to produce a comp, or I'm going to produce a prototype, and I'm going to poop that over to the engineering team. And I'm going to make them deal with it, right? And I, I just can't stand that philosophy, honestly. And more often than not, what ends up happening is you find that nothing works in Drupal, right? Like, nothing was designed to work in, you know, or Drupal or, you know, anything, right? That the minute you change like one letter of one content, this line goes down over here and then this whole screen breaks and then the prototype explodes. Like that's what happens. It's kind of crappy, right? So, and I, I've kind of learned that design is one of these things that is always aspirational. Like design as a discipline is I want the most, the prettiest, the best, the, the most aspirational, perfect visual that I can ever achieve, right? And really, like, you know, when we look at engineering disciplines, we often have to, like, say, well, we don't have $8 million to build a Drupal site. We have to make concessions. We're not looking for perfect all the time. We're looking to get something that works and gets the job done, you know? So they're really kind of disconnected as two disciplines, in my opinion. And there's really no shared language to have or hold these conversations. So when they're throwing stuff over the fence, from design into engineering, more often than not, they're not giving you exactly what you need, right? You don't have any way to communicate these specifications. It's super hard, right? So, you know, we really need to be looking at ways to solve this problem. Like, one way to do it is, again, splitting things up into smaller chunks. It is way easier to solve problems at a micro level than it is at a macro level, right? So that's what atomic design strives to do. Atomic design really takes these things that are like, I have something super tiny on a page, like, like one title, right? One paragraph, one link. And then I'm gonna roll that into a much larger set of things that end up coming together. And by the time I'm done, I now have a set of pages, right? But those pages may be comprised of 40 to 50 atoms or 10 to 12 organisms, right? That then can be reused across pages. So that's kind of how philosophically this is supposed to work. So what are the complements to Drupal? Well, a tool like Pattern Lab is great because you are producing a technical artifact. All the static design related assets that you produce in your Drupal site to, to get a theme or to do something like that, you can do that in Pattern Lab. You can do Twig, you can do CSS, you can create JavaScript, and you can have static images for your logos or for the icons that are on the site, all that type of stuff, right? 
And these are the same things that engineers that we do in the Drupal community when we're building out themes. The overlap is 100%. So instead of having your design team go and throw an image at you, wouldn't it be more ideal if they're actually turning over a pattern lab that actually gives you assets that you can work from? It might not be perfect, but I would much rather be putting my effort into solving that problem as opposed to figuring out what the designer wants. And I think it really reduces the burden on, on an engineering team. And so this to me is a risk mitigation strategy, <laughs> right? It's not perfect for everybody, you know, really is designed for larger teams, but, but uh, this is one way that you can really share assets across the entire process from creative into engineering. And so this is a really super busy slide. I apologize, take your glasses out, everybody squinting. So what are the opportunities for Drupal? There's a lot. So, you know, again, we talked about reusability as a principle. So we are, we are looking to make the most out of what is delivered to us. We're gonna reuse as much of that code as we can, and we're gonna ship it into Drupal and try to make the best use of it that we possibly, possibly can do. And so then we're, we also wanna try to integrate, you know, that from a theming layer with Drupal. But we wanna integrate that with all the other stuff that we've built in Drupal. We want all the content types. We want all the taxonomies. We want all the paragraphs and the custom block types and all these other things that you have on your site. So we wanna be able to kind of bridge that from an integration perspective, right? Uh, but the cool thing is, again, we're gonna let the designers go and do designing things. We're not gonna to touch their work. We're not gonna affect their work. We're gonna focus on how to make it work and bridge those things. Um, one of the cool things is there's a lot of stuff with the theming layer that actually is really easy to do these types of things. So uh, there's the components module already that you can include twig files. And uh, because Pattern Lab is built uh, with a lot of modern uh, technology that uh, you can you know, minify and aggregate the CSS that's produced across all these patterns and have like one CSS file or one JavaScript file that gets shipped and transferred. I've got like six blog posts on this topic, by the way. So if you are really curious or passionate about it, I would encourage you to go to my blog and read up more. But one of the great things is, instead of this like, hey, I'm throwing stuff over the fence, this design library becomes a living technical artifact. It's actually usable then, right? Like it's something that you can evolve and make incremental changes. You don't have to go and have to pay a design firm millions of dollars to keep producing static comps all the time, right? Someone submits a pull request to their pattern lab repo and boom, there you go, done so. Uh, so there's a ton of also potential like ramifications of using this kind of decoupled strategy. The, the uh, great thing about it is it actually works really well with something like React or Vue, right? So all these uh, progressively decoupled apps or even fully decoupled apps with Drupal this stuff works really, really, really well because you're just separating certain aspects of it and then you can go and produce these really rich uh, JavaScript-driven uh, JavaScript interfaces and interactivity that you want from those interfaces. And all the styling and everything kind of is provided elsewhere. So I think it's pretty neat. Um, yeah. Cool. Questions on Pattern Lab? Everyone good? Get the picture. All right. Quick question on the pattern lab. Have you used it where one pattern lab feeds multiple independent Drupal sites? Yes, that's exactly what my blog post is about, the first one I wrote. And there's different, they call it the Nerdstein method. There's actually different, yeah, sorry, it's kind of snarky. Um, <laughs> there's actually different methods for doing it. A lot of people embed these things in themes. Like that's one of the approaches that, that uh, the community has produced different. Um, different themes like Shyla and I, uh, there's like Emulsify, I think, that do a bunch of these embedded pattern labs. No, like my approach was, okay, if I want to mimic what an enterprise does, I'm gonna create a pattern lab that could be used across thousands of websites. How do I do that? And I talk about the use of Composer and mapping things into a theme and, and everything like that. So yeah, feel free to take a look. Thanks. Cool. All right, now we're getting into non-Nerdstein territory. This is called Ryan Bateman territory. So I'm gonna do my best to be Ryan Bateman today, but I wanna freely admit to you all that, you know, this is like not my 100% space of, of things that I'm super amazing at. But we're gonna talk through it, we'll work on it, right? So the first is GraphQL. So what is GraphQL, why do we care about it? What, what, is, 
what is good about it. So I'm a big fan, honestly, of like standards. Okay, I think standards are really important. When you don't follow standards or you don't use them, you end up having surprises, right? And sometimes as engineers, we want to get creative and just build wildly custom things. And we love the thought exercise and the passion and energy behind that. But honestly, doing things in kind of a predictable way is usually good, right? So what about GraphQL? How does that play in? Well, first, it's backend agnostic. GraphQL is a, like a kind of querying language that provides a, an interface on top of an API, okay? So it's not trying to reproduce your API or change your backend. It's going to sit on top of it. And what it's going to allow you to do is run REST queries that basically you know, go through and dig through any of the entities that are behind the scenes of the API and give you like a URL that is built in a standard way that you can make a request and get a set of data out of it, right? But you, know, you could say, well, that sounds exactly like REST UI. So what are the main perks? Well. The great thing about it is that you have the ability to customize exactly what you want, okay? So with REST, you often get like whole sets of objects or whole sets of discovery. Like I've got a big payload of things. You might not need all that data, right? GraphQL is really cool because you could say, I only want these fields and I only want this information and I want it filtered by this and I would like that structured this way and that's exactly what you get. So it gives things like, uh, you know, say like a React front end, a ton, a ton, a ton of power to write as many queries as it needs to get exactly what it needs from an API. And to me, that's very, very, very powerful coming from a very conventional web service approach like, you know, that to me is much more monolith. So the key, the key thing here is really around microservices, right? But the other thing that's really cool is around the abstraction. So you can have GraphQL, and that's a standard format, a delivery format for getting, retrieving, sending data, right? If you go and change your backend someday, guess what? That GraphQL API stays 100% the same. You can replace that backend like that. So you decide you want to go, you want to move away from Drupal, well, okay, fine. Go push your data somewhere else, go move it to Contentful, have a field day, and change your uh, GraphQL settings and point it to something else. Dunzo. Yes, it's that easy. So I think that's really where this value add is coming in, right? Oh, and I brought in some uh, Pattern Lab uh, stuff on this slide, I apologize. You can ignore that. I, this is the first time I've given this presentation. Did I say that before? All right, so what are, what are some of the complements to Drupal here, right? Again, it's really about standardizing the open format for delivering this data back and forth through web services. The Drupal 8 has a module, the GraphQL module. It's in uh, release candidate status. I'm not sure which, which version, one, two, three, I don't know, right? But this drastically and, and radically simplifies any type of of headless or decoupled querying that you need to get from behind the scenes. And I think, honestly, this can really empower front-end developers who probably don't need to know all the gory details of what's going on with Drupal <coughs> behind the scenes. They just don't care about it, right? Like, they don't need to. So something like this is a way to do something in a standard manner that they're used to. You know, because GraphQL is an open standard. It's used by many different systems. This is not Drupal specific, right? Another cool thing about GraphQL is that it does understand and recognize type data. So you have that kind of information and power at your fingertips, which is cool, right? And that integrates well with Drupal because Drupal also has type data. And so, you know, as we already said, or as I you know, shared, that you can still query all of Drupal's entities in its system. You get all of its properties, all of its metadata. You could filter things down. You could specify the fields you want. And it's a great way to, to throw an API on top of, of what you have going on in Drupal. This tool right here is called Graphical. Um, and the really awesome thing about this is this helps with discovery. So you've got this GraphQL API, right? And it's just running behind the scenes. You can't really see it or do anything with it. 
So how do you actually go and write the queries to do these things? And I know Sean's sitting here nodding his head because he and I were just banging on this tool yesterday in our training, right? So Graphical was really awesome because it has like things like autocomplete and you could see all the information on the right side of the screen that gets returned and you could drill through Drupal's, you know, GraphQL API and get all the information out of it that you want and it, it shows you the query right there on the left, right? So it's a great way to discover and debug queries and go through and, uh, and get what you need. And all you do is click that little play button and then <laughs> you get that information. And you can also pass parameters at the bottom. It makes it really easy to see or mimic different requests. Yeah, so this is kind of like a query explorer discovery tool. Yeah. All right. So what are these opportunities that really Drupal can serve in this capacity? We've kind of hit on it already. Well, this is really intended to be giving a standard API uh, format on top of Drupal for decoupled purposes. Uh, I think that there's a tremendous benefit to using something like this because it can really reduce the amount of data that you need uh, because of the ability to filter and the ability to send and get the data that you want, you know? Um, and I think this is kind of one of these portability things, too, because this is an open format that engineers outside of Drupal, this kind of brings people into the community, in my mind, because we don't really, you know, care so much that Drupal is a back-end data source. So there's people out in the world that are familiar with React or familiar with GraphQL or Gatsby, and they can interact with the Drupal site pretty, pretty elegantly and painlessly because it's a standard format. And I think uh, what, what Ryan's opinion on this is, is really that this seems to be the way that people are going. Like this GraphQL format is becoming the standard if it isn't already. So tools like Gatsby, it's built out of the box in their stack. So like, you know, to me, getting familiar with all of this seems to be wise, uh, you know, in terms of uh, getting using it as an API tool. All right, well that is a great segue into uh, Gatsby JS. And I was uh, had the pleasure of sitting in the training yesterday on Gatsby, uh, which was really good, by the way, if you do have an opportunity to do that with Jesus, uh, or um, what was his name? Yeah, yeah, then definitely uh, please, please take advantage of that. It was worth the time. So let's talk a little bit about it. So the claim here is, is really modern web tech without the headache. You know, and I think this, you know, again, very marketing, very salesy, but that's what they try to say. So what, what, what are we really working with here, right? We're looking at static site generation. We are talking about the, the key opportunity with Gatsby is producing a static artifact. And there's so much benefit to doing that. But it's a lot more than that. So people have probably seen tools like Jekyll uh, and other uh, static site generation tools that just, you know, go and query things and then they produce, you know, a set of HTML files or something like that, right? Sounds familiar. So really, where, where's the leg up here with Gatsby? Well, Gatsby has tons and tons and tons of um, plugins and opportunities to mediate those requests and it's a framework. So it's actually using React to build these pages. It's using React and GraphQL to get that information and produce these artifacts behind the scenes. And it's a programming framework, okay? So you can do a ton of different stuff and extend these use cases as needed. And it's pretty, it is pretty fascinating. So the great thing about, uh, so this static site generation is it's, um, yeah, really designed to be platform agnostic, so you can pull data from anything, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, WordPress, Contentful, anything. Markdown files. That's actually the biggest plugin in Gatsby. Did you know that? That you can go and, and pull data from a file system and generate your Gatsby sites as a data source. Fascinating. You know, so there's a lot of perks to using an approach like this uh, that really come down to like performance uh, and security. So you get this performance by default because it's producing a static artifact. So you can drop things in uh, to like a, a static host, right? And you get like blazingly fast page loads and 
um, yeah, just really, really fascinating things. And it has a lot of plugins that, that do some cool stuff too, like responsive image generation that can help with performance, prefetching. Uh, there's a, uh, an image plugin we saw yesterday that did this like blurring thing that can load an image really fast and then build it back in on really slow connections. So there's a lot of like fascinating problems that can be solved by using this type of an approach. Um, I, I think it was pretty neat. And really, like, you know, we all have been in the position where we've had to maintain Drupal sites, right? And it can be painful, you know, and if you're, you know, moving on from that or you're feeling burnt from that, maybe you want to move your Drupal site to something that's kind of behind the scenes and more private. Maybe you want to deprecate it. So this is a really good way to try to do that uh, by pulling data from your Drupal system, producing something static that is public facing and not worrying about the rest, right? And so there's kind of this, like, I think debate going on. We heard a little bit about it yesterday. You know, because this is a microservices architecture, you're getting a lot of exposure to React and these web services and things. But the end result is really a static site. It is static, okay? So is it intended to be static or is it really kind of a lazy caching philosophy? And I think like that's kind of a debate we need to have to understand, yeah. Okay. 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Time for Q&A. Oh, crap. All right. Uh, so the compliments to Drupal, you can make things really simple. I'll be very fast. Um, blah, 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 blah. Decoupled, best of breed technology, React, microservices, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Drupal has a lower footprint. Uh, you can possibly do migrations off of it. I want to do Cypress super quick. Okay? Super, super, super quick. My question is, do you Cypress quick? Yes. I can do Cypress quick. All right. Cypress is awesome, for the record. Cypress, uh, I love it because I am not a JavaScript developer, and things like Puppeteer and Mocha and a lot of these JavaScript frameworks that have been used conventionally for testing, like they're great, but they're very programming heavy, uh, and they don't offer a lot of features outside of that, right? Uh, Cypress is really super cool because it actually provides a dashboard here that gives you not only the programming APIs and the framework that you want from a modern JavaScript framework, but also gives you the ability to then go and have a nice API for querying it. And why does this matter? This matters because you can inspect a browser right on the fly. A lot of the testing frameworks go and execute tests headlessly, and they spin up browsers, but you can't interact with the browser. It's going and doing steps and running things, right? You can't really inspect or go through and dig it. But guess what? You can with this. And it's fascinating, uh, the ability to go in and really debug tests as they are running, right? And so this kind of can lower the barrier of entry, especially for people that are doing QA activities on a site, okay? So that's the big, to me, uh, the big aha. And it uses a lot of standard stuff that most modern JavaScript frameworks are using, you know, async await, promises, things like that. Uh, so there you go, there's some code examples, right? And there's a, these are all Drupal based, by the way. So you can go and look at it later. And I, I think the main opportunity really for Drupal in this context is, is that we, uh, the JavaScript test base got deprecated, you know, in Drupal core. And I think there's a very real opportunity here for something like uh, Cypress to, to be used. But, uh, you know, a lot of things are moving towards Nightwatch JS because of the JavaScript initiative right now. But I still feel like Cypress has a place and is probably a more robust tool at this point. That might be a, a rogue opinion, but that's my opinion. Cool. All right. Thank you all so much. This is a very rapidly changing landscape of cool technologies, but they're all heading in some fun and neat directions that we haven't really seen before. And I am happy to take questions at this point in time. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Right when you got pressed for time was right when you were about to get to the bit about um, lazy caching or something with a static site generator. That yeah. Like yeah, and it's not one that I have to admit that the Ryan Bateman, if he was here, this would be a... Repeat the question. Oh, yes. Thank you, Benji. Yeah, so the question around lazy caching versus static site generation, right? It's almost like the analogy that, that's best 
probably more apt here is like you have a tool like Varnish, you know, that can cache Drupal data easily, you know, and, and sort of can sit on top of Drupal as a proxy. And that's more the, the caching approach, you know. But then you have something like, you know, Jekyll that conventionally could scrape a Drupal page and produce HTML. So where does Gatsby fit in that model, right? Which one, which one does it more closely resemble? You know, and I think because Gatsby itself has, and I didn't really get to this, so I, that's why the argument kind of was, was moot, but the, um, Gatsby has, uh, and, and Drupal, they have the ability to kind of interact well, right? So like if you save a node, you can produce a new Gatsby page, right? We saw that yesterday. You know, and uh, so does it become or does it resemble more of the varnish, the lazy caching strategies? Or is it more of the I produce an artifact, or is it both? You know, it's kind of hard to tell exactly where the future is with something like that, with what we're doing. But I think the clear overlap here is that, you know, for things that are static, you know, in Drupal, it really uh, does present a very compelling platform to consider for producing, uh, you know, a front end. Takes a lot of headaches away <laughs> on the end. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it was less of a question than just like a, hey, I want to yeah, sorry. This is the first time I've given this talk, so I need to trim up certain parts and keep keep the topics moving along, I think, a little better. Yes, sir. Uh, Elasticsearch, if I wanted to take advantage of things like uh, the dashboard and blog stash and think about it, can it live alongside solar? Is there any? Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Question? Oh, uh, can, can solar and elastic live together in harmony? The answer is yes. In fact, I actually think like they're built on some of the same technology, believe it or not. Um, but one, one example that, uh, you know, just to answer that question really head on, that uh, we have some sites that are still serving search in solar, you know, that's built through Pantheon or Acquia or whatever. But then, you know, you get an elastic search instance and you're, you know, piping your logs into that or you're, uh, you know, building like, something that you know could be a really um, rich application that you know could leverage all, all the querying features and the boosting and that type of stuff so uh, yeah we've done that you know and, and I think it's totally plausible uh, any other yeah Benji so Gatsby uses GraphQL to query the Drupal site um, and you mentioned the GraphQL module but um, I, I think in my little experiments, I've done it with just the JSON API model. Oh, yeah, sorry. That that was um, me probably trying to save time because I was going to get to that. Yeah, so the, the main modules, uh, to repeat your question, is, uh, you know, isn't JSON API uh, used to do Gatsby stuff? The answer is absolutely, yes. So, uh, but GraphQL uh, is more of the, the format or the means of querying that is used on top but, but of it. Do you need the GraphQL module for Drupal? I, I never installed it, so I don't think so. I'm not sure. I mean, that's uh, something probably Ryan would be able to answer. I don't remember. No, the answer is no, according to Sean. Yeah. Uh, GraphQL, Drupal GraphQL module is not used by Gatsby. You use Gatsby, or use GraphQL in Gatsby, and that gets transcribed from the JSON API yeah. in order to query the Drupal site. Cool, so to repeat that for those uh, listening at home, uh, that the uh, it's using uh, JSON API through GraphQL and, and Gatsby. Yeah, did I get that right? Cool. Cool. All right. Any other questions or comments? I do apologize for for um, glossing over some of those bits at the end. Hope, hopefully, I got the main points out. No other questions or comments? Yes, sir. So we are just neat. What would you if you're building a site from nothing? Right now, high scale something, right? It's going to be lasting five years from now. So. You know, I mean, it's it's weird, right? Like HTML and CSS never change. That's correct, right? <laughs> so, I mean, if if I'm if I'm doing something from you know total blank slate at this point in time, uh, I'm picking or selecting what the best back end that I want is, if that's contentful, which is really easy 
to use and, and simple to model data, I might pick that. Uh, Drupal is a little more complex to model data, but you have a lot more stuff that you can do. So uh, WordPress is also very popular and has a services endpoint out of the box. And then I would uh, throw some Gatsby on top of that, you know? Uh, to me, that's probably what I would do. And, you know, you could regenerate that site as much as you need to. And uh, you have something nice and static that's fast, performant, checks a lot of boxes. Uh, Netlify, we saw that yesterday, which uh, was really fascinating in terms of a host or an endpoint for Gatsby. Uh, amazing what you can do with free tools today. I'm like, I'm fascinated by that. Uh, any any other questions? I feel really bad I didn't get to dig into a lot of the, the nuanced points. I'm getting the, the time flag, yeah. Go ahead, yeah, Jacob. Oh, I, I just have a question. I have feedback. If it's like, I'll, when you talk about like, with, I, I love the presentation. I love your sequence because you're getting these key concepts that we all need to pay attention to, and these concepts are moving very fast. Yeah. And like, I'll give a really concrete, and this can't get totally recorded. It's just better for Like a concrete example, like with Pattern Lab. I, Pattern Lab is brilliant. We can all be on the same page. This concept of breaking things down into smaller parts. But the Pattern Lab project, I can. I have some insight on it's shifting, it's not being very well maintained, it's not a criticism, it's open source. But there's now, um, Evan Lovely, who's doing the PHP side, has moved on to Bangrock, yep. which is a much more refined, it's the same concept, but a more refined approach, it's more, it scales better, it's more dynamic, yep. and it, it plugs in. And it's a very tricky thing with all of these different concepts. Yeah figure out which one's going in the right direction, what's the next generation, what's the previous. Even with yeah. with HubSpot, I find it funny in the Drupal community, it's definitely worth talking about Salesforce. It's like those two contrasting approaches, because the Salesforce integration in Drupal is amazing, like on a scale that people don't recognize. Yeah. Where it saves you tons of money and works. Um, and I think that's an interesting, I just see that as an approach to this presentation where you want to contrast it to if there's the concept, and then the, having two technologies you can kind of balance off of. Um, and I can I made some notes because as you're going through, I'm like, personally, I explored Elasticsearch and Solar, and we went with Algolia, which I think is mind blowing. That's totally outside of. Yeah. That's like if you're doing any search exploration, you want to try Algolia, which is like a service API where you it takes one day to say will this work or will this not work, and then that company has a lot of merit in the open source community. So all their APIs are like they're a service provider with a lot of open source contribution. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and that, that's a great that's a great point. I'm not I'm not uh, standing on a soapbox saying that these are the only technologies to consider. And certainly, even you know, you mentioned the Pattern Lab alternatives. You know, Bedrock uh, Fractal is a big one. I think that you know should be talked about uh, as well. I think that's the name of it. Um, but. Yeah, that point is not lost on me at all, yeah. No other questions? I think I'm out of time, according to Benji. Thank you so much. <laughs>